right, are we going to leave the lights like this, or maybe we should turn them I'll, down I'll, a little I'll bit? I'll turn them down a little more so we can yeah. really see. Yeah. So we can see the beautiful, rich colors. Yeah. Oh, that's better. That's what I'm going to say. So I've been a living historian for over 50 years. I specialize in lots of different areas. Most recently, I have been focusing on pirate reenacting, as you can see in the center scene. And as Krista mentioned, I've written two books, uh, Pirate's Life of the Golden Age of Piracy and Pirates of the Florida Coast. So please take a look at those books when my presentation is over. But tonight, we are not talking about pirates. We are talking about George Washington. And most people know a lot about George Washington in his later life. They know about him being the first president, the commander of the army during the Revolutionary War. But very few people know about George Washington's earlier life. When he was 21 to 23 years old. And his actions in the woods of western Pennsylvania started the Seven Years' War. So what is the Seven Years' War? Well, it's well named because the war lasted for seven years. And it was primarily between Britain and France. But all those guys jumped in on the various sides. So it was kind of like a world war. And in Europe, it was a massive war with huge armies going through the countryside and doing major battles. So how did this war start? Did it start over the traditional com uh, competition between nations for trade or border disputes? No. It started right there in the backwoods of Pennsylvania. And in North America, the Seven Years' War was called the French and Indian War, which is probably a much more familiar name to all of you. It's the war with Last of the Mohicans and Rogers Rangers. So if any of you have heard of those books or seen those movies, that's the war we are talking about. Now a little bit of background before we get into the war. La Salle was a famous explorer for the French. He had settled or explored a lot of area in New France, and he came up the Mississippi River. And La Salle claimed all of this territory for France. Now, Louis XIV was king at the time, so he named this new territory... Yeah, come on, Louisiana. Yeah, i got to make sure that nobody stands in front of the computer so it doesn't quite a line of sight thing. Now, while he was doing this, he ran into a conflict between the Algonquins and the Iroquois, the two predominant language group tribes in North America that were bitter enemies. Well, he decided to jump in and help out the Algonquins. You can see a little picture there of the French troops firing on the Iroquois, and this set up a relationship of the Algonquins being friendly to the French and the Iroquois being enemies of anybody who was friendly with the Algonquins. So in North America, the tribes that were primarily aligned with the French are shown in blue there. The Huron were actually an Iroquois language group, but switched sides, and sides sided with the Algonquins. Meanwhile, the British tribes were predominantly located in upper state New York. The Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, and the Mohawk, and they formed the Iroquois Confederation. That circle is where our story takes place, right at the confluence of the Lenete and the Seneca. Now, you'll hear this term a lot, the Forks of the Ohio. What do I mean by the Forks of the Ohio? Well, it's three rivers. Actually, it's two rivers that join to form one. You've got the Allegheny River that comes down through northern Pennsylvania. You've got the Monongahela River that comes up through West Virginia. And where they meet, they form the Ohio River that flows into the Mississippi. The forks of the Ohio were the most valuable real estate during this time period. Whoever controlled the forks of the Ohio controlled trade on the Mississippi. Now let's take a look at a 1733 French map 
You notice the green territory? That's what France claimed as theirs. Uh, the British were kind of isolated all along the coast of the yellow with Spanish. And the forks of the Ohio were located right there, clearly within French territory. Plus, the Algonquins said they could stay there and actually sold them the forks of the Ohio. Well, here's a British map from 1755. It's kind of interesting because they just claimed everything to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, running on out, showing the forks of the Ohio clearly in Virginia. And the Iroquois sold them the forks of the Ohio. Uh, nobody really had title to this land. You just kind of walked by and somebody said, hey, I'll give you a whole lot of money for that land. Okay, you got it, buddy. So Virginia in 1751 decided to exploit this concept of expanding trade. And they sent Christopher Gist, who was a frontiersman, all the way from the capital of Virginia, which was Williamsburg, to Logstown, which was the nearest Native American capital. It was the capital of the Ladepe. There he goes. And he meets with the chief, secures a treaty, and actually develops his own little farm called Gist's Plantation, just south of it. But in 1753, he was alarmed by the fact that the French had the nerve to build a fort, Fort Venango, very close to where he was operating, close to the forks of the Ohio. He just had to report this back to his boss, so he hurried on back to Williamsburg to tell Governor Dinwiddie what the French were doing. In the capital of Williamsburg, and there's uh, the governor's mansion, he met with Governor, Governor Dinwiddie, who decided someone has to take a message to the French to politely say, Get out. <laughs> this is our territory. But who would that person be? It would have to be an adventurer. It would have to be someone loyal to the crown. It would have to be someone that had an interest in the Ohio Company of Virginia. And they chose 21-year-old George Washington. Why? Well, he was a surveyor. He could make maps. Plus, his two older brothers were the senior investors in the Ohio Company of Virginia. So he was very connected to their end game uh, concept. In November of 1753, George Washington made his first trip to the forks of the Ohio. He went along with Christopher Gist. They went to Wills Creek, which was a small trading post on the Potomac River. And from there, carried on past Gist's <laughs> plantation, where he stopped off to say hello to his wife and then went further on up to a place called Frazier's Cabin. John Frazier was a trader who had been there several years on very good terms with the local Native American tribes and had a small cabin. Now, they made this trip in November, and anybody that's been in the mountains of western Pennsylvania knows that it gets kind of cold and rainy in November, so they were traveling under the most miserable conditions possible. From Fraser's cabin, they left to meet with the Lenepe at Lockstown. And that's where George Washington got his first glimpse of the forks of the Ohio. He thought, that's an ideal spot for a fort. That's just absolutely perfect. We have got to build a fort there. Then he continued on and to Lockstown and met with the chief of the Lenepe. There they ratified their treaty. Everything was going well. Everything was going to be perfect. The Lenape were all on board with this, and the British were ready to move in. Now, there were two men that were also there with this meeting. A man with George Washington called Half King, and another man named Manakatutha. Now, these were two Iroquois chiefs. One was from the Seneca, and one was from the Oneida. Now, what were they doing there? Well, the Lenape weren't very powerful. The Iroquois had all of the power. And the L L Iroquois had given them orders to cooperate with the English. And they sent two heavyweights, some very important chiefs, to make sure the Lenape towed the line and followed instructions. Now, actually, their title was half king. In other words, they each had equal authority. Get it? Half king, half king. It was more of a ceremonial title. But this man here, who George Washington called Half King, was really named 
ten a garrison. I thought, I think that George Washington couldn't spell ten a garrison, so he just always referred to him as half king in all of his communications and correspondence. So from Logstown, they set off to Venango to deliver the message to politely ask the French to leave. There they go. And they arrived at Venango, which was a fairly large fort with about 700 troops. And the French were very polite to their English visitors and said, no, no, you've got to talk to our boss. He's further up north at Fort LaBeouf. So George Washington and his party continued on to Fort LaBeouf. There they met with a commanding officer, a man named St. Pierre, who was also very polite, but Washington could realize that he's being stalled for time, that the French have no intention of following his directive to leave. Quite the contrary. While he's talking and making negotiations, St. Pierre is secretly trying to get Manakatutha and Half King to switch sides. Well, Washington realized, I've got to get out of here fast, because we could lose the whole ballgame here. So he and Christopher Gist set off to return back to Logstown. And they had to go on foot because the weather was so bad, there was no grass for their horses to eat. And their horses were too weak to carry them. So they set off from Venango, and suddenly they were attacked by a band of uh, Algonquin tribes. Unknown arrows came flying at them from everywhere. And they started running. And they covered 100 miles in two days on foot in December in Pennsylvania. And then they got to the Allegheny River. And they had to cross it in order to get to Fraser's cabin. So they built a raft, but the current was very swift. And as they were trying to cross the river, suddenly Washington falls overboard. <laughs> So George Washington is in this freezing water. Hypothermia is setting in. Washington literally has two minutes to live. Otherwise, he would freeze to death in the icy cold water. But Christopher Gist jumps in too. And I guess he was better qualified, a little bit stronger, and he managed to grab Washington and pull him ashore. And they made it to a small island where they spent a very cold night. Next morning, the river had frozen solid. So they didn't need a raft. They could walk across. And they did. Once they got to the other side, they quickly went back to Fraser's cabin, who had fresh horses with grain that he had kept in his storehouse, so they could return to Williamsburg on their horses. And they reported that the French wouldn't leave. Meanwhile, while he's back in Williamsburg, George Washington wrote a book <laughs> all about his experiences in the, in the forts of the Ohio. I have a copy of that book. And I used that as the basis for the research for this part of the presentation. Well, the British built a fort at the Forks of the Ohio, a small, unimpressive fort called Fort Prince George. And their plan was to build a road from Wills Creek to the Monongahela River, and then be able to take supplies up the river to the Forks of the Ohio, and then build their whole trade empire. Well, it wasn't long before 600 French soldiers swarmed down from the north and attacked. Here's a bigger diorama of the same fort from a museum showing the French soldiers approaching the fort. Now, there was no fire when the few British soldiers, there was only 43 of them, saw the 600 French troops, they surrendered. So the French burned the fort, but they allowed all the British soldiers to go free, and they returned to Wills Creek. They also burned Fraser's cabin. They wanted all of the English out of the area. And built a much better fort, Fort Duquesne, which is what my college was named after, Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. George Washington was a major. He's back in Virginia. And he was given command of 160 troops of the Virginia Provincial Regiment with specific written orders from the governor. You are to retain all such offenders, and in case of resistance, to make prisoners of or kill and destroy them. That's pretty clear to me. So Washington went back to the forts of the Ohio, and he got as far as the Great Meadows. 
which is about maybe 50 miles, 40 miles from where the Forks of the Ohio are. And it's a beautiful spot, great place for a camp. And he met Half King, his old buddy, with a small band of warriors. And Half King told him about some French troops that may be nearby. Meanwhile, the French had sent a small group of troops, 35 troops, under the command of, I don't speak French, I don't pronounce French, so I'm going to do my best, Captain Joseph Colomb de Germonville, and his orders were to deliver a summons to George Washington, telling him to politely get out. Now something about Half King. He was a very wise and politically savvy individual. He had a hidden agenda. His agenda was to start a war between the French and the English. Because he really wanted that territory from all the Algonquin tribes. And if he's got a war going between England and France, the British will give him guns and supplies to further his war. And then once he gets rid of all the French and Algonquin, well, then he can attack the British because they won't be expecting it. That was his hidden agenda. So he convinced Washington to attack these French troops. They were camped below a steep cliff called Jamonville Glen, named after the captain, Jamonville. That's an actual picture that I took of that glen. And the British carefully maneuvered into position in the darkness of night along the top of the ridge with the French down at the bottom, while the Iroquois positioned themselves off to the side. What happened next would be the subject of much controversy over the next several years, probably even still today, and was the trigger that started the Seven Years' War. The facts were George Washington's troops fired down on the French. The battle lasted 15 minutes. 10 French were killed and 21 were captured. One British was killed and three were wounded and Jamonville was dead. Now, there were lots of different versions of this story on how the British behaved and how Jamonville was killed. Some of them very anti-Washington. And as I said, that triggered the Seven Years' War. So in Washington's own diary, he says that when the French saw us, we opened fire. The French returned fire effectively for 15 minutes. The French routed and ran into the woods, but were returned by the Iroquois. And Jumonville was killed during the battle. That's not very complete for a man that normally writes very eloquently with a incredible amount of details. His diary was surprisingly scant. Another officer pretty much said the exact same thing. Exact same thing as Washington said, only that Jamonville was killed with a first fire. But then when they started interviewing some of the British soldiers, a more likely version came out. The French were alerted by a noise and the French fired first. The British returned fire. The French routed and were turned by Iroquois, same as Washington said. Jamonville was taken prisoner and he was treated very well by Washington and the British. Then suddenly, Half King walked up behind him and crushed his skull with a tomahawk. That's how Jamongo was killed. Part of Half King's plan to start the war. Well, the French version was a little bit different, and this was told by a few soldiers that escaped and made it back to Fort Duquesne. The British fired two volleys, the Iroquois didn't shoot at all. The French offered absolutely no resistance. Jamonville gave a summons telling the British to leave. While speaking, Jamonville was shot in the head. And the British would have killed all the prisoners if Half King didn't stop them. Now clearly this is twisted to make the Iroquois possibly still join up with the French. But it gets worse. By the time it got back to France, Washington was the first one to fire without giving the French any warning. The British killed all their prisoners, and the Iroquois scalped them. And Jamonville was tortured to death by George Washington himself to get information. Now, unfortunately, when PBS did a docudrama of this incident in 1975, starring Rene Aubergine, 
That's the version that they chose to use in their docudrama. Yeah. After leaving the French camp, they returned to the Great Meadows, where George Washington built a small fort. People have criticized him for that. Why would you build a fort there? But those were his orders. He was not in command of all of the Virginia troops. He just had a small portion. And his commanding officer with the rest of the troops were due any minute. Plus, there was a whole large group from South Carolina. They were all going to rendezvous with Washington at the Great Meadows. So his orders were to stay there and wait for the rest of the troops. And he figured he might as well construct a small fort while he was waiting. The fort was completed on the 2nd of June. And on the 9th of June, the rest of the Virginia regiment arrived. Plus, on the 11th of June, the South Carolina Independent Company arrived. When the rest of the Virginia troops arrived, he was given the startling news that the commanding officer was dead. He accidentally fell off his horse and broke his neck. So now Washington was in command. And according to tradition, your rank goes with your level of responsibility. So he was promoted from major to colonel just from the fact that his colonel was no longer there. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the French left Fort Duquesne with 600 French troops and 100 Native Americans, mostly Huron and Shawnee, commanded by Jamongle's brother. They came down the river and then up the trail to where Jamonville was killed. Then they went on to attack George Washington and Fort Necessity. Now the battle started off with traditional European tactics. The British troops went out to meet them in linear tactics, and the French all lined up, and we were getting ready for the battle. And shots began running out between the two. And it actually looked like the British were doing very well. The French were taking more casualties. So eventually the French fell back into the tree line and then started sniping at the British troops from behind trees. Well, Washington realized, I'm not standing in the open for that, so he pulled all his troops back to the safety of the fort. That's a painting at the museum at Fort Necessity showing Washington's forces gathered back at Fort Necessity. The sniping continued at noon, and and then it started to rain. You can't fire flintlocks in the rain. So battle was called off. So Washington stayed in his troop, in his fort, and the French stayed surrounding the fort. Washington had 31 dead and 70 wounded. Until that evening. At 8.30, the French sent a messenger. We'd like to discuss peace terms. And Washington went to see what they had to say. And he took with him uh, Captain Jacob von Braun. The only officer Washington had in his command that spoke French had been killed. So von Braun, who was Dutch, who spoke English as a second language and French as a third language, stepped in as translator. But he didn't speak French really well. <laughs> and that would turn out to be a problem for George. Now the terms were, you're allowed to go to Will Creek. You could march out with your colors flying and your drums. You could keep all your weapons as long as you destroy the artillery. And you have to promise not to build any forts for you. Yeah, those are pretty good terms, really. And you have to return the prisoners taken at the Glen. Oh, no. Here's where the problem came in. That's the document that George Washington signed in French. And here is the English translation. Our intent had never been to trouble the peace and good harmony which reigns between the two friendly princes, but only to revenge the assassination which has been done on one of our officers. Revenge the assassination. That implies it was illegal. Well, when von Braum interpreted that for George, he interpreted that as revenge the death. That's okay. That one word makes a huge difference. And George Washington marched off on July 4th, 1754. When he got back to Williamsburg, the military tribunals began. He didn't accomplish his mission. He was supposed to drive the French out. And instead, the French drove him out. 
And then all of the testimony of Jamonville Gwynn and the discrepancies began surfacing. Governor Dinwiddie lost confidence in George Washington and fired him. George Washington returned home to Mount Vernon, a totally disheartened individual. All his life, the only thing George Washington wanted was to be an officer in the British Army. And now, that chance was gone. His military career was over. Meanwhile, back in France, Jumonville's death caused a huge disruption. The revenge, the assassination, was the key point that the French politicians used. There were news articles, there were even songs and poems all about the evil George Washington and how he had killed one of their men. All negotiations in the Ohio country came to an end. The French felt they had the advantage. Meanwhile, back in Parliament, the same type of thing. A lot of people were upset. One man. Horace Walpole, a, a parliamentary member, wrote, The volley fired by a young Virginian in the backwoods of America set the world afire. But then enter the Duke of Cumberland. And his attitude was, so what? So some French officer got killed in battle? Big deal. That's what they get paid for. And Washington was only a provincial. I mean, they're not real soldiers anyway. So what is the problem? Well, who was the Duke of Cumberland? He was the senior military officer in the British Army. He was actually head of the British Army. And he was also the second son of King George II. So he's kind of an important guy. He said, I will oppose the enemies of my country and that part of the world myself. And he ordered... England to attack France on four fronts all along the border between New France and the British colonies. He selected to lead this attack a man named General Edwin Braddock. Now, he had a very limited career as a command officer. He had only been in one combat engagement in his entire career. He was just promoted colonel a year earlier. But he was commander of the Coldstream Guards, which was the best and most trusted unit in the British Army. And he was loyal. And that's what the King and the Duke of Cumberland wanted. We wanted an officer that we can depend upon to be loyal. He was ordered to attack the forces of the Ohio first, and had along two very important men, a man named St. John. Sir John St. Clair, who would act as his quartermaster, and his aide, Robert Orme. Now they met with Governor Dinwiddie in Williamsburg when they all arrived, and Governor Dinwiddie introduced them to Christopher Gist, who would serve as their personal guide. Also, John Fraser was going to go along as chief of scouts. But in the meeting, Christopher Gist and John Fraser said, there's only one man you need to take back with you. Only one man that can really pull this off, and that's George Washington. And they convinced Braddock. So Braddock sent his aide, Robert Orme, to Mount Vernon to offer George Washington a commission in the British Army as a colonel and as personal aide de camp to General Braddock. This changed overnight in Washington's world from being, my career's over. I will never serve in the army. Now he's back in full swing in the British army with the important position as colonel and aide de camp to the senior British officer in North America. General Braddock went to Alexandria, Virginia to meet his forces, which arrived by ship. Then they all met up in Frederick, Maryland, which is the staging area. Now there was a tavern there, and it's a good idea when you're having an important political meeting to meet in a tavern. And George Washington and Edward Braddock met a third gentleman at this tavern, a person you may have heard of, Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin was supposed to pro provide the food and wagons for the operation. There they are. But he wanted the unit, the whole operation, to go through Pennsylvania, where he could supply them easier. It's going to be tough to supply them through Virginia. Washington agreed, 
But Braddock said, no, I'm going to go through Virginia. So why would Braddock do that? Well, he had promised Governor Dinwiddie that he would have used Virginia. Why? Because he would leave a road a road that the Virginians could use to trade on the Ohio. And they would cut Pennsylvania out of the picture for competition for trade. Now they also had camp followers. Camp follower has kind of a, a negative connotation nowadays, but back then it was a regular part of the British Army. They were the wives of many of the soldiers who went along on the campaign. They actually got one-fourth pay for whatever their husbands were paid. So if you were the wife of a colonel, that's pretty good. And they would cook the food and mend uniforms and serve as nurses during battle and went right along with the troops. If their husband was killed, they had 30 days to remarry or they would have to leave the camp. <laughs> there were allowed six camp followers per company or 60 women per regiment. Now, Braddock's forces had 154 officers, 2,441 men, and 56 drummers. Why drummers? And in case you don't recognize it, that's me when I was 17 years old. <laughs> drummers were the communication. All signals on the battlefield were given with drummers, even when to fix bayonets, when to fire, when to move, advance, when to retreat. So every officer would have a drummer right next to him that would give them signals on the battlefield. And they also had 180 camp followers. <laughs> the entire operation was poised in Frederick, Maryland, ready to leave. It took them nine days to travel the 129 miles to Wills Creek. Now what do these roads look like? They look like that. That is actually a photograph I took of part of the road that Washington took going to Wills Creek. The going was pretty rough. But something very interesting happened. Braddock and Washington became very, very close. Braddock saw some genius in the young Virginian. And for Braddock, Washington was the son he never had. For Washington, whose father died many, many years ago, Braddock took on the role of a surrogate father and military mentor. But what's more important is Braddock did not treat Washington like a provincial officer from the colonies. He treated him like a regular British officer. Now, for Washington, that was glory. He had really achieved his goal. When they got to Wills Creek, they met up with two chiefs. One was Monocatutha, who told them that recently, Half King had died, probably of tuberculosis, from the way he described it. Now, St. Clair went along with the advanced part. He was going to leave Fort Cumberland and build the road, chop down trees, build bridges, kind of make the camp up. And Braddock was going to connect, yeah, they are, chopping down trees, or a lot of trees in West Pennsylvania. And on the 10th of June, Braddock left with his main body, thousands and thousands of British troops, plus artillery. So they left, made a camp, made another camp, and they made a third camp, a place they called the Little Meadows, right after they crossed the Savage Mountains. Those are well named. Braddock's Road exactly follows Interstate 70 today. If you drive an Interstate 70, you're on Braddock's Road for a large part of it. And the Savage Mountains are tough to cross on an interstate. I can't imagine how they got across those mountains with wagons and artillery. And they really didn't do too well. A lot of their artillery, the ropes broke, the artillery fell down into the bushes. It was a disaster. So after that, Braddock called an officer's call and asked advice. George Washington was there and said, you need to split your command. You need to move ahead to Fort Duquesne with a faster force and let the rest of the troops come on a slower pace. And Braddock agreed. So he left with 1,200 men and 50 camp followers to go towards Fort Duquesne. 
The rest of the force would follow under command of Colonel Dunlop. The next morning, Washington was taken deathly ill, probably dysentery. He was totally incapacitated, could not walk. He had to be put in the back of a wagon and go at a much slower pace. So he rode with Colonel Dunbar's column for a little while. Now, the army came to the first crossing of the Yakagani, called the Little Crossing. Looks like that. That's the spot where they crossed. Then they went on to the Great Crossing of the Allegheny. Looks like that. A little wider. Fortunately, the water's only about two feet deep, so they could kind of walk across it. Today, looks like that. <laughs> they didn't have that risk. Then they went on to the Great Meadows. That was the spot where Fort Necessity had been. There's a little part of the road, of Braddock's original road, in the Fort Necessity National Park, which is really haunted. Right about that time, they started getting sniping from the trees as they approached the fort. They went past Gist Plantation and crossed the Yakagani for a third time at Stewart's Crossing. That water is also very shallow. You can walk across it and not get your knees wet. From there, they continued on making camps. Now, just went ahead to the fort with one uh, Iroquois and scouted it out. And they actually killed a French officer who wanted to scout it out. So they had some pretty good intelligence on what the French were doing. And they could tell that they were getting more and more supplies all the time. They were preparing for a battle. July, they continued on further. And at night time, they were attacked by 30 Indians. But they were easily driven. They continued on to the last camp. This is where George Washington, now fully recovered, rejoined Braddock. And a good thing for Braddock for Washington. This was the night before the battle. Now their plan was to cross at Turtle Creek and then march the 10 miles to attack the fort. But Turtle Creek was problematic because the walls were very steep, even though it's only about as wide as from me to her. It's like 20 foot walls on both sides. You couldn't get the wagons and the artillery across. So they decided to take an alternate route, cross the Monongahela River twice and then onto the fort. Now normally, all through this campaign, Braddock employed very, very good tactics in movement. This was his formation. He had a couple scouts up at hand to watch out for anything dangerous, and these scouts were constantly coming back and reporting on what they were seeing. You have a vanguard of troops, your best troops ready to attack anything. You've got left and right security moving with your column, and your artillery aren't really in the front where they can bog down the line. Most of your artillery is in back. But the predominance of your wagons with the food and supplies are all in the rear. You only have a couple of wagons with ammunitions. This is the absolute best way to advance tactically, and Braddock followed it impeccably. When he got to the river at 2 a.m., they began their crossing. He carefully sent troops across to scout the other side and set up position. Then he formed another guard which crossed the river and guarded both sides of the crossing. By 8 a.m., his main force arrived and began crossing with Braddock himself in the lead. Now all this time they expected the French to attack. If you were going to be attacked by the French, here's where it comes. When we're across the river, we're weakest. This is where the French is going to take us out. But nothing, not a sign of the fish. Everything was silent. Just birds chirping. That's a diorama showing them crossing the river. They can have a little, their Fraser's cabin burned out in the diorama, right where they crossed. Well, when his troops got to the other side and there was not a single sign of the French, they all began shouting, who's off? Who's off? They had won. The battle was over. 
And in Braddock's mind, the French, realizing that they were about to be overwhelmed with superior forces, burned the fort and evacuated. He told this to George Washington, who said, no, no, don't, don't believe it. Don't believe that this victory is that easy. Be cautious, there we go. Be cautious. But Braddock, for the first and last time, did not listen to George Washington. His normal battle formation was changed to a parade formation. He was going to march in victoriously. Sure, he still had scouts, but then he had all those musicians up in front so they could play as they were marching in to the destroyed fort. There was Braddock. But he had wagons all throughout the formation. Wagons with food, so they could make camp easily and set up and be ready to go. And when they got to the fort, they could prepare for whatever. Meanwhile, back at the fort, you had the captain, Claude Pierre Picardy. I don't know how to say his name. He was commander of the fort. And commander of the Canadian troops was Daniel Bougeot. They had 108 French regulars, 146 Canadian troops. Let me go back up. 637 Indians, but very little supplies. Supplies hadn't been coming in like they thought. So the commander wanted to, we're in the fort, and let's go, let's leave. We can't beat these British. But the Canadian officer, Bougeot, said, let's, let's try and ambush them. I know we can stop them. I know we can get these guys. And they're arguing all morning while Braddock's forces are crossing the river. Well, finally, the boss said, OK, I'll let you go with 30 Canadians and 300 Indians to see what you can do to ambush them. So Bougeot left Fort Duquesne <coughs> to attack the British at the river. But the British had already crossed the river and were on their way towards Fort Duquesne. <coughs> they met quite by accident as both forces were going along the road. Neither one of them expected to see the other. And suddenly, the British were face to face with the French. And the French were like, there they are! What do we do? Well, the British reacted first and opened fire. And the first round went right through Bougeot's head and he was killed. But the French returned fire, quickly. And then all of the Indians scattered into the, into the dense forest one would expect. The British began to fire back in all directions, but the Indians were in the woods too deeply. And then the French troops went into the woods too and circled around behind the British. It was very chaotic because of all of the wagons, the troops couldn't maneuver. The artillery was now in the way. It was just all jammed up and nobody could do anything about it. Meanwhile, the rear was still crossing the river, wondering what was happening up front. Well, they could hear gunfire. Little by little, the French and Indians continued to fire from deep within the woods. Well, there we go. They were targeting deliberately all the officers and drummers, taking out the leadership and the communication of the forces. And everyone kind of rushed in from the back to the front while the front troops tried to fall back, and it got more jammed up. Braddock, realizing what was happening, decided, I'm going to gallop right to the front and take command. So he did, and had four horses shot out from under him, but still got on another horse and went right back to try and restore order to all of this. Meanwhile, George Washington, there he is pictured right there, got a field piece and started firing into the enemy position. But in no time, there was so much smoke, nobody could see where to shoot at. That little valley was just filled with black powder smoke in all of the trees. Then Braddock was shot, a mortal wound, and fell off his horse. And Washington was right next to him when it happened. What happened next is one of the most remarkable things of this battle, as Washington knelt or stood beside his mentor and dear friend, General Braddock. Braddock gave Washington command of the entire operation. And Lieutenant Robert Orme backed Braddock up. He went to the other British officers and said, no, Washington is in command. I know that you might be senior to him, because there were a lot of senior colonels. Washington's in command. 
And Washington did his best to rally the troops. He mounted a horse and tried to direct the fire back at the enemy. He had three horses shot from out of the world, and he had eight bullet holes in his jacket, even though he remained unwounded. Eventually, the Indians stopped shooting at him because they were convinced he couldn't be killed. Now, by this time, battle started at 2 p.m. It was now 5 p.m. Each soldier has 24 bullets in his cartridge box. That's his cartridge box right there. By now, all those bullets were gone. So it wasn't a total rout. It's just like the confusion of the battle. The British had nothing left to fight with. So they retreated. Braddock was thrown in the back of a wagon with Washington right next to him. As they were returning towards where Colonel Dunbar had his camp, Braddock died. His last words spoken to Washington were, we shall know how to fight them next time. There's a monument where Braddock was buried, because they buried his body underneath the road. They didn't want the Indians to dig him up and mutilate him. And his body was discovered in 1803 when they were building a highway <coughs> there. I said, who's this? Oh, it must be Braddock. And they built a monument. <laughs> With that battle, Braddock's defeat, well, we go. there we go, the Seven Years' War began, full swing. Washington was given command of a fort in Virginia, in current Winchester, Virginia, called Fort Loudoun, for a while, the beginning of the war. And then the new commanding general of all British forces in North America, the Earl of Loudoun, decided in 1758, let's make another try at this fort. This time it would be led by a general named John Force. And Colonel Washington would go along, as usual. To Forbes, though, Washington was just a provincial. He never treated him like an equal, as Braddock did didn't listen to Washington's advice, and relegated him to a second-tier command. Now, he wanted to take the route through Pennsylvania. Oh, sorry. Washington urged him to take Braddock's road. Now, Washington didn't like that before, but now the road was already built. The trees were cut down. There were bridges built. It was ready to go. We could use that road with no problem. But Forbes said, no, um, I don't think so. Uh, no supplies down in Virginia, you know. And this oh, grass is terrible there. Horses need grass. I'm going to go through the Pennsylvania route. It's slower, maybe, but safer. So Forbes' plan was to leave Fort Loudoun and go through Pennsylvania, building a series of forts as he went, so that he would have supplies and be able to fight if attacked. Washington went to Cumberland to get his troops and would join them at Fort Ligonier. Okay, here we go. We're going to build some forts. They're uh, a little bit too fast. Do you want to see the dotted line? There they go. They march. And they built their first fort, Fort Littleton, Fort Bedford, and then the big fort, Fort Ligonier. And when I say big fort, this is definitely the biggest and strongest of all. That's what Fort Ligonier looks like. There is a beautiful reconstruction, which is a living history museum there on the same site today. Nice barracks, vault walls. You're, you're not getting over that. And Washington finally arrived on the 16th of October. On November 11th, Forbes arrived and decided, we're going to halt for the winter. I'm not in no hurry to get the French out of Fort Duquesne. Washington thought we should push on, but no, no, let's halt for the winter. Then on the 12th of November, they got a report that there were 100 Indians and 40 French scouting around just north of Fort Ligonier. So Washington was given the task of capturing them. He came up with a plan. He was going to do a double envelopment with his second in command, Colonel Mercer. It didn't quite work out that way. Washington got there first and was able to easily overwhelm 
the French and Indian forces and captured most of them alive. Then Colonel Mercer began, just as a very heavy fog rolled in. When Colonel Mercer got there, Washington troops thought they were more French, and they opened fire. Mercer thought, it's the French, we found them, and they're attacking us. So his forces opened fire. And you had a battle going on between the two Virginia forces in the fog. Washington realized what was happening. And in an act of incredible bravery, galloped between the two forces, knocking muskets out of men's hands with his swords, yelling ceasefire, while bullets from both sides whizzed past him. But the information he brought back from the French prisoners is that the fort was very low on supplies and weakly managed. So Forbes decided, all right, let's go for it. Let's attack Fort Duquesne now. Washington was given orders to go first and set up the advance camp, and then Forbes would follow with the bulk of his army just a day or two behind Washington. They got to a spot we just 12 miles from the fort. And that's where Forbes and the rest of his troops finally arrived. Now that we're ready for the assault. The next day, they got to Braddock's Field, maybe a mile away from camp. This must have been a very strange feeling for George Washington, because this is the place where he was defeated. This was the place where he saw so many casualties. In fact, the field was littered with skeletons and British equipment all over the place from three years earlier. One of their officers, Major Francis Halkett, found the body of his brother, found the bother, body of his brother, Colonel Halkett, and actually recovered some of his personal possessions, which he brought back to his family. The next day, they made a camp close to the fort. They were all ready to attack the next morning, when suddenly, they heard a tremendous BOOM! Which rang out throughout the trees. What had happened is, the French blew up the fort. They realized they had no way to fight off their overwhelming strength, so they blew up the ammunition and abandoned the fort. Washington and Forbes arrived at the site of Fort Duquesne and marched into an undefended territory. For Washington, this was his lifelong dream come true. He finally got to the forks of the Ohio as a British serving officer and got to overcome the French that had been his adversary for so many years. The British built a new fort, a much bigger fort, called Fort Pitt, on the site. Today, that's Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That is the outline of where Fort Duquesne was. And this is the outline of where Fort Pitt was. And some of the walls from the original Fort Pitt are still there and preserved as part of the museum. The action in the woods where Washington was knocking muskets out of people's hands while his two forces were firing each other would be the last time George Washington would wear a British uniform in battle. After the Seven Years' War was over, he was elected to the House of Burgesses. He married Martha Washington. And in 1775, George Washington was named as Commander-in-Chief of the United States of America forces fighting the British. Many of the officers he encountered during his war had been fellow officers with him at Braddock's defeat. Now you know the truth. Now you know how the Seven Years' War actually began. Do I have any questions? Yes, sir? I was curious, uh, uh, early on when you were listening all of the um, uh, folks in the army, you listed, I think, 154 something officers. Yes. And 180 something um, 
the, the ones that go, you know, the wives. The camp followers. The camp followers. So it was more than just the officers who had Oh, camp most of the camp followers were wives of enlisted people. They were? Yes. Uh, the officers, very few wives, they were welcome to come along, and like the head wife of all, the, uh, one of the senior officers' wives served as the senior camp follower. But most of the camp followers were, from, were privates, wives and privates. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. What's the deal with sticking your hand in your shirt? Like you're holding uh, it was just how, you know, you'd have to ask the, the artists. Artists asked people to pose that way. Uh, and I guess they thought it, it looked nice at, the, at that time period, but that was a very common thing to pose. And you, you see photographs from like the mid-1820s and 1830s. Everybody is posed. Yeah, right. yeah it's, it's just something that artists like to do. So you'll have to, to talk to them. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. These trips back and forth were when we talked about the Spanish and the fleet, the car took three months to cross the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So if you were sending a message, it took three months to get here. Yeah. Months to find where I was going, months to go back, and three months back, so six months to mm -hmm. last. Pretty much. How much do these trips take in terms of time? Say, so just pick a couple of trips, and how long were they? Weeks, months? No, so uh, Braddock, Braddock had 18 camps, which means it took him 18 days. So uh, from, from Maryland to Pittsburgh, 18 days. When they returned, it took them less time because they were running. And they weren't really bothering to make camp. They were like, let's get out of here. So uh, they got back relatively quickly. And uh, his aide, Lieutenant Robert Orm, kept a very detailed book of all of the special orders that the general made. I have a copy of that book, and I use that to do a lot of the uh, presentation for Braddock's battle. Yeah, there's a lot more I just didn't have time to go into. Yes, sir? One final question. The uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. was uh, not very willing to support the revolution, from what I heard, and that uh, that's why George Washington was up in Valley Forge instead of being in a warmer place down in Virginia, that the farmers and, and tradesmen had to, uh, the army had to buy from those Pennsylvania farmers, and, right? But in the Revolutionary War, when you're talking about Pennsylvania, you have to separate out the politicians from Pennsylvania and the people from Pennsylvania. The politicians were reluctant to go to war, and one of them actually resigned from Congress because he would not sign the Declaration of Independence. And it was because the we want to fight for our rights, but we still want to be British. We don't want to cut our ties with Britain. That's the way they felt. Uh, you talk about the, the woodsmen in Pennsylvania. Boy, they, they hated the British. And they were delighted to go. The Pennsylvania riflemen were delighted to go to war with anybody, really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. How did Washington go from the British forces to join the American forces? You, 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 you talked about you getting married and then... Yeah. Right, so Washington would con continue to wear his British Army uniform on state occasions at every opportunity. Uh, he was so proud of being in the British Army. And everybody was up until 1774. And that was a big turning point in all of this. Uh, something I didn't have time to mention was the regiments the British used in Braddock's defeat all came from Scotland and Ireland, not from Britain. Because Parliament had a special deal where if you use British army, Parliament has to pay for it. But if you use Scottish and, Ar and Irish regiments, we can send the bill to somebody else. And that's exactly what they did. They sent the bill to the colonies to pay for the Seven Years' War. And that is what started the whole Revolutionary War later on. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the French lost seriously, and as a result, England got all of New France, which became British Canada. England got Florida, which became British Florida. 
France lost Louisiana to Spain to pay the debt, which became Spanish Louisiana, and all of the other countries in Europe pretty much stayed status quo. But it was a huge victory for the British and a major defeat for the French, which also made the French hate the British, which is why they were e eager to help us. Yes, sir? A lot of the maps showed different spelling with Pennsylvania and so forth. Mm -hmm. That was because Nobody really, they wanted to do it my way, not the highway. Well, spelling was up for grabs in the 18th century with a lot of things. Uh, I have a sample of one person that spells his own name four different ways uh, over the years, depending on what year you're looking at. So, uh, yeah, you really can't read anything into it, it's, but spelling was not a priority. Certainly wasn't with George Washington. He's almost as bad a speller as I am. Uh, are there any other questions? Well, you've been a delightful audience. Thank you so much.